Okay, it's, it's, it's great to uh, have everyone um, together again. A few have had to rush, but um, do, if you did attend without registering, leave behind your email address and details so we can send you the recordings, so we can tell you when we have other conferences. I think most people here did register via Eventbrite, but if not, um, please leave with um, uh, someone your email so it can be used. This is good friend Ben John uh, from Christian Concern. Ben, would you, before um, asking these questions, um, tell us a little bit about who you are and what work it is you do and how that has anything to do with today. Yeah. Great. So uh, I work for Christian Concern. We've got the stool uh, just there at the back uh, with some of our books and resources that we've published uh, and, and things like that. So a lot of the work uh, that we do um, can, be, can be like reacting to a lot of the fruit uh, the bad fruits that we've seen in the collapse of identity, the collapse of the family, uh, and these kinds of things, particularly in, in law and, and politics and media. So the case, you may have seen it this week, of the doctor uh, who was sacked uh, for not wanting to use transgender pronouns and these kinds of things. Uh, he was one of our clients. Uh, another one of our cases, was a, uh, a uh, which was in the media this week, was a, uh, a dancer who was sacked from the musical The Colour Purple, um, because they've dug up an old Facebook post saying that marriage was between a man and a woman. So we kind of do a lot of legal work protecting there, uh, but also raising awareness in the church about stuff that's going on politically. So, for example, trying to raise awareness before they pass the thing about relationships and sex education, about the gay, gay sex education in schools. Uh, we were really trying to mobilise churches to respond to that, uh, responding to changes in abortion law, things like that. How can we be, uh, have a voice on that? And my particular role is being... Uh, thinking more about the future, how can Christians be engaging the culture, how can we be having Christians with robust biblical worldviews in different areas of life uh, who are standing firm, uh, bold and courageous to speak of Jesus Christ. So we have a program called the Wilberforce Academy, which is kind of for students, 20s and 30s, uh, where we equip and train uh, Christians uh, uh, to stand firm, think about these issues and engage on these issues. And so it was through that that I got to know Reagan, and I've been working for Christian Concern, developing the Wilberforce Academy for about a year and a half now. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, let's go to God in prayer and open the session. Ben has some questions that you've um, given. We'll go through those. Father, thank you for this day. We ask that you would give us your grace and wisdom now as we consider these important questions that have been on people's minds and hearts. Uh, help us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Great. So to start, in a culture where singleness is put on a pedestal, how do we paint a positive view of marriage to those around us? Do you want to ask? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, interesting you say singleness is put on a pedestal. That's mm. an interesting phrase, whoever uh, wrote that question. Because to some extent it is, um, uh, and the, you know, obviously the scriptures speak of singleness being good and, 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 and glorifying to God. Um, but the scriptures also speaks to marriage being the norm. And I think, you know, there can be, in the name of wanting to actually not exclude singles in our talk about sex and sexuality and, and marriage, we sort of kind of elevate singleness as, the, as a thing and then forget the importance of, of, of marriage. I think we need to teach uh, about biblical marriage in, the, in its full context, that marriage at creation is a picture of God's love and redemption which points all the way to consummation, so the earthly marriage is an ultimate, marriage of Christ and the church is ultimate, which means if you're ever preaching on marriage, you're preaching to marrieds and singles, because all of the church is married to Christ, her bride, uh, groom. Therefore, that marrieds and singles um, should be praying for marriage, the doctrine of marriage, and, um, and, and rightly pursuing marriage as a, as a, 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 a legitimate, godly, and a uh, noble uh, goal for a, for a man or, or a woman, all the time realising that uh, you're complete in Christ, whether you're married or single. Um, so I think that that's how you can address it, and, and not being you know, a, a afraid, as I say, to teach the whole counsel of God, even on the issue of marriage. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, um, and I'll finish on this, Martin Lloyd-Jones said that you know, we, we often look for marriage in the ethics section of the Christian bookshop. Well, actually, it should be in the doctrine section mm. of, of, mm. of Christian bookshops because it is a, p 
picture of Christ and the church and this union with Christ that uh, is a massive doctrine. Um, so that's that's how I would answer that. Great. Yeah. 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 Is masturbation a sin for self-gratification? Is lust a sin? Jesus says, if you have lust in your heart, you're committing adultery in your heart. Right? So, is it possible for masturbation to be acted upon outside of a lustful impulse outside of objectifying another individual. I don't think it can be. I think if we're all honest in this room, it, it can't be. And so whether or not we like to sort of kick the ball into the weeds a bit and say, well, okay, but no, let's, let's answer it as Jesus would answer it. You shall not commit adultery, right? But if anyone has lust in his heart, then he's committing adultery in his heart. The scriptures give a model for meeting sexual needs. Marriage. And if you don't like the phrasing that I use there, go back to Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians. And you'll see very clearly that marriage is a means through which the normal, natural, sexual impulses are met. And yet the norm has been in this day and time for um, pornography or objectification of others to in some way kick marriage back. So going back to the first question, singleness, being put on a pedestal for many, um, that's okay because really sexual needs are being met in other ways. But are they? Not sexuality as God intended it. Mm. Yeah. And, just, uh, and then I think that's all absolutely right. And then uh, one more thing I would think of is that the, the, the God created sex, the act of sexual union between a man and a woman in marriage, and part of that is then uh, that sex is um, is other centered in in your in the sex sexual action with another person and aimed at the pleasure of the other person. Whereas masturbation is what you call solo sex, and it's actually a self love in a way um, that doesn't have any other centeredness. It's just you, um, and it's you pleasuring yourself. Now we recognise obviously that you know. Uh, for uh, some singles might say, oh, for marriage, you, you know, you might have that outlet. We, we don't. And yet it, it's an issue for a lot of married people um, is masturbation as well mm. because it's become a habit. And, and in, in Christ, we can have great victory in taking every thought captive to Christ and, and using our sexuality, whether married or single, for the glory of Christ. And I've known many people that have had uh, real victory in this area. So... You know, if it is something that you are struggling with mm. or have struggled with, uh, there is great hope that you can gain increasing victory in that area and, and pursue purity. Because yeah. as, as uh, Raven rightly pointed out, it's very difficult to partake do, in masturbation without uh, lusting. And it doesn't fulfill God's created purpose for this sexual yeah. act. Yeah. All right. Um, maybe with this question, it would be good to, if you have any anecdotes from your pastoral ministries, what are your thoughts or what does the Bible say on dealing with sexuality for people with learning disabilities? Mm. How can their needs be met in this area and be met according to biblical principles? I like this question. It's really deep, it's substantive, and it goes beyond the, the normal sort of idea. But um, you open a newspaper and you see this discussion um, quite a bit. I remember a few years ago uh, this sort of revelation that Stephen Hawking was um, going to these strip clubs and um, lap dance clubs and things and people were like, oh, what? You know, and then there was a whole um, expose in, uh, I think it was the BBC, it was, it was not really an expose, it was just talking about the sexual needs of people with learning disabilities and um, how there are certain prostitutes and certain people who 
actually count this as part of their industry. Um, you know, however disturbing people may, may find that, what makes it any more disturbing than any other, you know, sexual perversion in, in some way? And the outlet is the same. I have a friend who was born um, with s some disabilities, right? And she was born blind, um, no eyes, and some other learning uh, stuff there. What's the outlet for her? She's married. She got married. There's a, a man that she met who's a Christian who uh, himself is blind, and they're married. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the idea of... I, I've come across situations where you, you have uh, individuals who have Down syndrome, and they are attracted to and love someone else with Down syndrome, and everyone's like, no, 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 no. You know, that's probably not a good situation. You know, the two of them together, it's not... Um, not great, it's not really for them, this can't work, this isn't wise, this isn't good. Why? Why? Can anyone give a reason? There's no biblical reason. There's no reason before God that can be given. Um, so, you know, to encourage, um, as you would with anyone, um, perseverance and patience and Christ-centeredness and singleness but to not act like marriage is totally out of the question. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people, I, I accept you do have, you have a spectrum of learning disabilities, right? And there, there are some very severe situations. Um, the principles remain the same. And, you know, I, I think you'll find that there are different levels of awareness of one's sexuality or of, of sexual desires um, across that spectrum. Um, so the, the, the question can be answered in a, a more developed way depending on what the circumstances are, but um, this, the principles we've talked about remain the same for everyone. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely. It depends what the disability is, how severe. And then I think with, with teaching and training that child as they grow uh, to a certain maturity, uh, you know, that would be down to the parents to pitch that and what le level are they learning as to how they teach and reveal God's plan for sexuality, as mm. we would all do as parents with our children, is, you know, you teach at age-appropriate ways, um, not what the government's doing and taking the authority away from parents and then teaching uh, yeah. on issues of masturbation to children who are five years old or whatever it yeah, is yeah. they're doing now. Yeah. Um, so, as someone who was sexually active before becoming a Christian, I have always struggled to view sex, the act, through the lens of union with Christ. I struggle to hold the two together. What advice do you have to help? Mm. Um, obviously, when we get these questions, it, you sometimes don't want to go in with a big old sledgehammer answer because you don't know the, the nuance around it. Or, but I think maybe the person who's written the question... Sexually active before being a Christian, yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe there's some s s undealt with guilt there, you know, unnecessary guilt, still feeling of that Christ has forgiven these things uh, at the cross, and you need to uh, embrace your union with Christ for forgiveness of sin, number one, and, and that in Christ, you know, you do have this new life, and you are being conformed to the image of Christ, and now you see sexuality different because we're all. Uh, sexually broken and sexually uh, distorted to some degree uh, you know outside of Christ and then inside of Christ we have this uh, new life new creation um, even though we have set sinful impulses they're being gradually put to death and um, I think you know the other thing to consider that but also to pray um, uh, a young man came to me and you know he, he had repented of his issue of pornography but you know he was saying things like this I actually still have dreams at times that are explicit and could, how can I have victory there and I actually said you know you can and but you must pray about these things that God would so uh, captivate your mind and, and begin to purify you that even your dreams have become pure <laughs> you know uh, when you're out of, you know your subconscious because the whole man is being renewed in the image of his creator mm -hmm. Um, and amazingly, you know, began to pray and began to ask the Lord. Because sometimes we talk about people, have you, and I say to the, 
to people, have you prayed and asked the Lord specifically about that? And they go, well, no, not actually. And yeah. So begin yeah. to pray and believe in the power of the gospel. It is powerful. You are a new creation. It is supernatural. Believe in the reality that Christians should be real with, with sin, but we're not going to be sinless in this life. So you might battle against certain things, but you can have increased victory. So for that person then, is there's hope that you can press on. Get, don't, God, God doesn't want to li you living in a, a low-grade guilt all the time. Mm. Yes, the evangelical <laughs> guilt of sin pricks the conscience, but only in driving us to Christ, where we, we find our identity and our hope to, to press on in these things. Yeah. Look to Christ. He's, he's the cure. Exactly what Gavin said. Yeah. I've seen a few Christian marriages fail which has taught me that being a Christian doesn't guarantee a successful marriage as it's a common, it's common grace, uh, Christian or norm. If marriage is a, is, is marriage a gift or a gamble? Good question. Um, so, yeah, first of all, marriage is a gift, always, 100%. Second, I say that as someone who was married, whose wife committed adultery, and who was divorced. I'm a Christian, right? The woman who was my wife no longer professes faith. And without going down to all the nitty-gritty of that, mm -hmm. I have seen consistently, consistently, where there is divorce in a so-called Christian marriage, there is often at least one partner in that marriage who is not looking to Christ. And consistently, you can look at a recent story of a well-known um, evangelical, ex-evangelical now, I think that's what he would call himself, um, Joshua Harris. Joshua Harris used to sit in similar seats. Joshua Harris used to preach similar messages on marriage, on sexuality, on divorce, and Joshua Harris, he, he was known in the early 2000s for writing a book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, and was talking about, you know, ha having a more intentional view of, of relationships. And a lot of people benefited from his writing. A few months ago, Joshua Harris left his wife. They parted seemingly amicably, but... Whatever the story, they left. They, they departed one another. After holding a view of permanence and after holding a view of, um, you know, marriages for life and all of that, gone. I made the point to a few at the time that not everything was only just about the marriage. What we're seeing here is not a departure from marriage and a falling out in marriage only. What we're seeing here is at least one, probably, in, in this particular case, from what I've seen, definitely one, probably the other, falling away from God. And in the time that has elapsed since then, that has been the case. Joshua Harris, an advocate of marriage between one man and one woman for life, going and marching in a gay pride parade in Canada, on his Instagram. He's not, he's not trying to hide it. He's flaunting it, apologizing for the words that he has said in the past, the beliefs he's, said in, he's held in the past, believing that maybe God is there, but not the God that is taught in the Christian gospel. So marriage is always a gift if it is centered in Christ, as we see in, in the scriptures, there's a list of virtues. I, I believe it's in 1 Peter where he says, if you have these things and are growing in them, you will never fall. 
You will never fall. Second Peter. Where one or both parties do not have these and are not practicing them, you will fall. Yeah, marriage is a gift. Fact from creation to redemption to consummation. It points to massive theological truth in which manhood and womanhood is, is swept up. It, no generation can have a high enough view of marriage because no generation actually has a high enough view of the gospel. Okay, so, so think of it that way. Uh, does it immunise you against risk in the, in the sense of there will be suffering in marriage? You will sin against your spouse. Your mm. spouse will sin against you. In that sense, no. You know, uh, the intention is, is for permanence. Absolutely, you know. And, uh, you know, traditionally, mm. evangelical churches have permitted uh, for adultery and abandonment. Uh, but it's, a lot, it's like the last result and you're wanting to press towards reconciliation. But, but ultimately, uh, in Christ, and I, I, as, as Reagan was speaking, my mind just went to uh, Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, God's working all things for the good of his, those who are in Christ, his, his people. Even the sufferings, even the difficulties and the trials of, of being married to an imperfect person. So marriage doesn't come without its risks of being hurt and, uh, and being in pain. Uh, but in Christ, he's working all things for the good of his people, which is the bigger marriage. And uh, that gives us hope then to, to press on. And in those cases where, uh, a case that Reagan himself has had to walk through and, and outlined, uh, I'm sure he could speak to you of the, of the even the, what some mean for evil, God is working for good. And the manifold wisdom of God through his own particular suffering in his own life and in the lives of many around who witnessed his own uh, faithfulness to Christ in those days and drew many to, to the glory of Christ through that suffering. So in that sense, there's no risk with God. Mm. Because he has written it from the beginning to the end for his people, so we can rest in that. Mm. Yeah, it's great. I sometimes say it's the it's not marriage that fails; it's the people that yeah. fail, which kind of yeah. says the real thing. Yeah. You know, the institution can't fail. Mm. If a married couple does not feel ready for a baby, mm. um, maybe we could speak into that as well. Is it godly to use contraception? Great question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm just giving me look over this way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think Christians need to think carefully about contraception. Yeah. There's some contraceptions, the abortifacients, that um, you know would would work as as an abortion would work. So the the egg is fertilized, and they just it stops it attaching and to, to the womb, but it actually aborts the baby. You have to think carefully about what you use. In general, uh, I don't think that uh, every, mm. I think the Bible speaks that every act of sex should be open to mm. a baby, but every marriage ought to be open to, to children, obviously realising that some can't have for physical reasons children, but mm. then there's always the option of adoption. Um, and so in that sense, so don't feel ready for baby, so conscious, the issue of contraception itself, is it ungodly? I don't think in it of itself it is, depending on which mm. one you use. Um, but every marriage should be open to children. And, and it's, um, it's a purpose of marriage, is to be fruitful and multiply. And so often we say, well, I'm not having kids yet because I want to establish this and I want to get enough money for that and I want to have the big house and I want to have the car so I can put the kids in and, and all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think, well, we need to return to, what, this is why you could teach well on marriage, what are the purposes of marriage? And it's one of the great things is to, you know, a marriage to be fruitful. And that's without putting hard and fast rules on young mm. married couples that say, within three years you better have a kid, yeah. else you're not being Christian. Yeah. But, and so these are wisdom things that we need to encourage people to think about. And then let that married couple, as they prayerfully pray about their marriage and God's purpose for their marriage, um, begin to put those godly desires and the uh, urges to, to, to have children and build and extend the, the family. Because the family starts with the husband and wife. Mm -hmm. Children don't make a family, right? You've got to remember that. Husband and wife is a family. Children expand the family. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, I uh, go along exactly with what Gavin was saying. I would say, you know, the morning after pill, not an option. Not an option. Why? Because it's a board patient. So anytime um, someone recommends the morning after pill um, as something that's a legitimate contraception, it's a contraception that is abortive. Um, it's at the very earliest stages. Um, I, I think Christian Concern does have a booklet or has some literature on abortion. Uh, on, abortion on, yeah. on abortion. Do you have one on contraception? No, no not on no. contraception. But. Okay. Well, um, people should think wisely through it. I would say just... A CMF of some notes. Yeah. Some articles Christian, Christian, Christian Medical Fellowship. You can find some things on contraception there. Christian Medical Fellowship. Uh, one thing that is really important to consider here, like Gavin was saying at the very end there, there shouldn't be this expectation that, okay, on young couples particularly, that they have a child or have multiple children within a set period of time. I talk with many people of different, um, different cultures um, where there is a 100% expectation that you will have a child within the first year. That's, that's an expectation. It's not necessarily rooted in any um, Christian belief, but it's rooted in um, cultural um, ideology of some sort. And if you don't have a child within a year, there's, there's an issue, there's a problem. Let me just pastorally encourage people to not approach young married couples and say, when are you going to have a child? Or are you thinking about kids yet? Because you don't know all that's going on. And you don't know how many people, and I, I know many people, who this is a, a quiet pain. This is a private suffering of theirs. They cannot have children for different reasons. But they don't feel like they have any reason to broadcast that. You know, it, it's, it's not there for the world. So they are married and they're faithful in marriage. And yes, they enjoy, um, this is, I tried to indicate my talk, you know, there's, there's the entrusting of, of marriage, yes, for procreation, if that happens, if that's God's will, but it's also there for purity and pleasure in the context of marriage, right? So having expectations or placing those on other people without knowing the situations you're, you're dealing with can be ungracious and inconsiderate. That's just a submission as an aside. For yeah, and as you were speaking, I was thinking of an article my wife wrote uh, about be fruitful and multiply. Mm. Just how many children should I have? Mm. And so for some women, you know, especially in North America where we live, there's a lot of families that get five, six, seven kids, you know? And, and I think a lot of people think, oh, I should. We should. And it, there's that kind of quiverful... Uh, right. right. <laughs> that we, you know, that's what you, you should be having tons. And beautiful, great. Uh, but also, it's you, your own particular marriage, and you don't know what's going on in that marriage, and what you can bear as well. Yeah. You need to know your own, uh, your own limitations um, as a uh, husband and wife, and, and for your own particular wife. So, these are where we need pastoral wisdom. And when I say pastoral wisdom, I don't mean just for pastors. Hmm. I mean, our thought hmm. is we minister to one another. So it requires us, these issues, to be quite other centered as we pray for one another in the local church and to know each other in the local church. And that's why we need to pitch for good, healthy church membership. Yeah, that's absolutely. Conference. Absolutely. Elia. <laughs> 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 God's purposes for, for marriage, uh, one of the purposes is for procreation. Therefore, each marriage should be, as you enter marriage, it should be open to, to the, uh, having children. If, yeah, it's an un, I would say, yeah, an ungodly impulse towards the institution of marriage and the purposes of marriage, yeah. The, the question has to be asked, like, why? What's why, the motivation? Why would you? So, What's the motivation? So what would, like, talk about sin beneath it, what would be the reason why you don't? What's behind sin? Yeah, and let's say the couple said, uh, because we just like having lots of money, mm -hmm. right? So there is a green money yeah. issue there, you know. Career. 
or occurring or whatever it is. Overpopulation. That's or a fear. You know, for, <laughs> for many women, <laughs> might be a fear. A fear of the unknown. A fear of, oh, what would I be like as a mother? Can I cope? And, and so underneath that fear is actually a mistrust, an unbelief in the, in the Lord to provide for you as you pursue his good purposes for marriage, you see. And so it does come back to sin issue. You have to name it for what it is. Um, but the, uh, it's, it's, it's nailing it at, its, at the right level, you know. Oh, we're well, okay. open the floor. <laughs> well, um, we'll, we'll come We've opened a can of worms. In, in a few and moments. Someone's waving a pen. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, you need to consider the health of the of the woman and the danger. So it, it could be that it could be it's a particular health issue that if she you know she could die from it. But then we talk about marriages also being open to children. There's also adoption as well, which is an extremely biblical uh, thing to to consider. But uh, yeah, we can talk about that another time. But Those, may, may, maybe next year we can look at this and like li and life and life. Yeah, that uh, might life be issues. You've yeah. given us a great idea for another yeah. conference. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, I, just on that. I encourage um, Christian Concern has a good selection of resources on these issues. I don't know yeah. if there's um, these issues back there today, but Christian Concern has loads of um, material addressing those issues, as does Christian Medical Fellowship. So, um, but life, yeah, yeah. maybe and another topic We dealt topic with this for staff at Highgate Road Chapel about three years ago mm. and talked about IVF, etc., etc. Yep. Sex and sexuality was the name of the conference. Okay. Uh, what are the practical steps a couple could make to maintain purity before marriage? Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty pretty simple. Ben, ben just muttered, "Get married." Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 here's the thing. I, I get a lot of people who will say, "Oh, we really want to get married. We really want to get married." Okay, great. Why, you know, why don't you get married? Well, we we just don't have the money because it's really expensive. What do you mean it's really expensive? Well, I mean, the wedding alone will cost a few thousand. Um, you know, maybe. You know, ten thousand. Honestly, um, I'm not going to get into how much weddings and stuff can cost, but um, marriage legally, you pay about eighty pounds to go up to a registry office to get that registered. That's not your dream wedding, right? But where where do we have this idea of marriage being a wedding where we we, we give this picture of the high life, right? You know, I, I'm going to roll up in my um, Rolls Royce Phantom and, um, and, you know, I'm going to get out with my guys, 10 groomsmen, um, all, all tailored suits. Um, and, and then the bride is going to, to rock up in a Ferrari or something. Um, rented for the day. And we're going to go into um, a palace that we've booked out. I, I'm not being facetious here. I really think we do need to consider, like, what on earth is going on? Why are we presenting a picture of something that we aren't? That we're just robbing marriage uh, as it should be of its beauty. We're robbing it of its beauty. We're saying this is about it's about it's it's about my happily forever after. It's about prosperity. And so you turn out. I've seen some astronomic sums that people spend. Apparently in the states, it's like thirty thousand. Um, plus, and okay, if people have, if people have and desire, and that's their scene, I, I'm not going to speak against that. But I think we really should think through, like, what are our motivations here? What are we? What message are we sending people? So, get married. That's what not Ben says. That's what that's what is in the Bible. Paul says, if your passions are burning. 
within you, what should you do? You should wait another year or two until that dies down. <laughs> and, um, or, you, you know, no, you, you should, um, you know, have a chaperone in place. Okay, you should be wise. I, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Be wise. You know where you are. You know who you are. You know what the temptations are. Get married. Get married. Yes. So I'm in a place now where I'd like to get married with but of course uh, my girlfriend's father and my parents are also thinking about okay we need to do it right, we need to include family, we need to have a big occasion, have a traditional middle of the wife, and there's so much kind of factors in place. How do we navigate the place where we want to honour our parents, but also, like you said, want to honour God by getting married quickly? Do you want to feed into this? <laughs> You said get I married can. quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, answer, my answer doesn't change. I, honest, honest, if I'm honest, my, my answer of, of, of marriage legally doesn't change. It's still, you can still have your white wedding. You can still have a cultural wedding. The marriage doesn't change. A wedding is not a marriage. Marriage is marriage between one man and one woman. It's a, a covenant, a contractual obligation, if we want to speak of it, is that before God. And yes, in the presence of others. Let's have a party after. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, we do want to, we want to honour parents and recognise certain cultures. So I, I've spoken in Africa last year, and of course the whole bride price thing is still, to, to Christians then, mm. they, you know, the bride price, paying a price for the bride has been abused in the past by certain parents that just, you know, I want 50000 for for my daughter because I put her through college, this, that and the other, and, and then the guy's in debt as he goes into the marriage and it's a disaster for the marriage. At the same time, uh, Christian couples are trying to see it through a Christian worldview, honour the parents. Maybe there's a respect and something they can give towards uh, parents' well-being and as a, as a honour for, for the daughter. Um, so we want to do that, but it can't be at the expense, obviously, of the, what's good for, for the marriage. One other thing I'd say about courting couples, the question to ask as well, even mm. with the whole physical thing is you get a lot of couples that say how far can I go or can we go without it being sin before marriage physically and I want to say wrong question the question is how best can we glorify God and remain pure and if that's your orientation and motivation before marriage that's a good place to, to be st starting with understanding God's uh, purpose for sex and sexuality understanding your own self Understanding that you ought to treat her like a sister in all purity. Mm -hmm. 1 Timothy 5, verse 1. So I talk about that. So people talk about, well, how far? We, well, we can be kissing, surely. And I want to say, would you kiss your sister like that? You can't get around that text. That might seem hard to people, right? That might seem hard. But I'm telling you that then you start kissing with your uh, fiancé and then that leads to something else and something else and something else and it moves on. First time my daughter and uh, my son-in-law kissed was at the altar, and I and, I, and by God's grace they were able to do that uh, and conduct their courtship, which wasn't too long, as Reagan said, in all purity, and it honoured it honoured the Lord. Uh, and no one re ever, no one ever regrets what they didn't do after they're married. They always regret what they did do before before they're married. If you know what I mean. Um, so we sometimes say, well, I don't want to put uh, overburden young people. And I always say, we're going to raise the standard because we want to raise our view of sex and sexuality, but we want to raise our view of Christ and the church and, and what we can do in Christ. Um, so short courtship, right view of um, sex and sexuality and pursuing purity and, no and knowing yourself rightly as well and your propensities. Just to use a sort of example that's been in the news recently. I don't know where this guy is. I am increasingly having reason to believe he may be a brother. Uh, but, um, you know, Justin Bieber, of all people, right? Um, he was on the scene as uh, sort of this, um, you know, pop star f for years. He would misbehave 
as we would see, you know, in, um, in quotes, the newspapers would uh, throw out something. But in the past couple of years, the, the guy has been pictured, um, you know, reading some good material. One uh, book uh, by Tim Keller, and he was weeping with his then fiance. Both of them are professing Christians. I, I, I can't say um, where they are because I don't know them. But what I do know is that they chose to get married, right? And everyone was so confused because they're like, oh, they, they are married, but they've not actually had a wedding. Well, then this past week or two weeks ago or something emerges, they, they had the white wedding, right? That They had the wedding, but they've been married for over a year. And when asked why, um, Justin was very clear in speaking of like how he had become convicted of past sin. He believes that marriage is between one man and one woman and that there should be purity um, for that. He understands that He wasn't living that lifestyle, but he desired to take that into marriage. And because of what Paul says, you know, they decided to to actually marry behind closed doors and then have a wedding later. I don't know where he is spiritually or where his wife is spiritually, but certainly that that looks like it's setting a good example. And I think we should be able to, you know, take a page from, from that book, which is straight from the Bible. There is a lot of confusion around the term sex, gender, and gender identity. Should we try to define what we mean when we use those words while engaging in any debate, etc.? Or should we insist on never using those terms in the first place? Sorry, I wasn't quite right. Sorry, Anna. This is Anna's question. Anna, (laughs) please. So let's insist yes. on defining our terms. Yeah. That, would that be helpful? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think so. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, for Christian Concern, a couple of years ago, you may remember this, um, I went down to Exeter University, and there was a debate on polygamy mm. with their student debate society. Um, as I sat on the panel, right at the very beginning, as the others were presenting their case before it came to me, it, it hit me, what we're, we're not talking about polygamy here, we're talking about polyamory. But they had a very specific question. Should polygamy be legalized? Mm-hmm. And so what I had to do then was define the term polygamy is talking specifically of this marriage contract, this marriage covenant. Now, uh, outside of Scripture, if you deny Scripture, if you deny Christ, if you deny His word and the goodness of marriage, there is no reason, apart from a social construct, for which you can say that marriage between one man and one woman is the way to go because you've removed Christ from the picture. Um, polyamory is what we see all around us. Many loves, right? They're with everyone. Like, like the chap I mentioned who's walking with his um, date the other day. I've been with everyone except you. Ha ha. Um, we, we have to define, yeah, we have to define the terms very, very clearly. Would you believe that they decided at the end of that polygamy, it's all good, should be legalized? And I think when you just define the terms, that's important because you can then say, well, actually, you're defining it slightly different from what I'm defining mm. it. But then we return people to the Bible. So, you know, like people say, well, if sex is what you were born, a male or female, g- gender uh, being a social construct in the way that you express your you know, feelings of uh, sexuality. And if there's a dysphoria or a disconnect between your physicality and what you're feeling, then you're free, gender is fluid, so you're free to pursue that. But if you look at Scripture, and this is a, this is a great point, because we want to be rooted in Scripture. Genesis 1, 27, God created man in his image. Male and female, he created them, okay? So you've got man made male and female. There's the sex. Next one. Go be fruitful and multiply. 
your physical function as a man or woman flows straight from your created sex. Get that? Your function flows from your created sex. Be fruitful and multiply. How? When the man and woman come together in their ma maleness and femaleness and at the point of most physical difference, they come together in one flesh and they can produce life and children. And, uh, and of course then the helper role and, and the headship role uh, in the marriage relationship flows straight out of created mm. sex. And, and we see that in Genesis 2.18, helper fit for him. So you've got, you see the connection there between created sex and even if you want to call it gender role, it flows from it, it's connected to it and they shouldn't be disconnected. If there's a disconnect in your mind, you don't change your body hmm. to fit your feelings, you change your mindset to fit your body because your body is, cr is created to tell you something of who you are in the image of God, male or female. Hmm. So, so we go straight back to that Genesis text and we can we define the terms, and then we can make our argument from Scripture. So uh, maybe a question I have uh, on that then is, so we're kind of saying man and woman are really the only two biblical categories two. we have. Yeah, How do we then respond to, say, evangelical ministries who perhaps do use the language of these categories of homosexual or same-sex attracted gay, gay Christian, but would maintain... a uh, an evangelical view on sexual practice. How do we respond to that? And you touched on that a bit in your talk, but yeah. it's quite common in evangelicalism today. It's very wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, and it's very dangerous. Very dangerous. This is what the whole revoice thing yeah, was exactly. about last year in the United States. We talked about that at last year's conference. You know, uh, you, you, you cannot be a gay Christian lustful Christian, whatever it is, you, you cannot be that. How can you be defined by something for which Christ died for on the cross? And at that conference, they were talking about there'll be queer treasure in heaven. No, they won't, because it has nothing to do with Christ. It, there will be no impurity in heaven. So it, it comes back to our identity uh, in Christ alone. Christ defines us. Uh, and those things, whatever they may, may be sinful, don't. And that, you see, that gives great hope to those who are are experiencing, let's say, same-sex attraction because those things don't define them anymore, that Christ has had victory over them and they can begin to actually have victory. It might mean they fight them, the whole, the fight those impulses the whole of their life, just like all Christians fight sinful impulses. Mm -hmm. And we might have our own specific battles in here. Some of us might be really kind of, you know, prone to anger or envy or whatever it might be when a fight that. And it might carry on, but we can have increased victory in Christ. But once you start defining yourself as gay Christian, a uh, transgender Christian, you've already accommodated, yeah. and uh, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's not an evangelical practice. They might call themselves evangelical, but it's not an evangelical practice. Yeah. What fellowship has light with darkness? Right. It, it doesn't. Story, you know, and uh, you, you come up here and look at some of these headlines and you can say okay well let's let's swap out the language someone has a compulsion to rape there are people who have a compulsion to rape there are sadomasochists who that's something that that they enjoy i'm a rape attracted christian does that compute um, you know yeah. over here pedophilia is a sexual orientation like being straight or gay yeah, that's, that's an actual headline. We're headed there. We, we've been there in the past. Read history. We've been there in the past. The days of the New Testament, as the words were being written, it was very, very common to see children um, abused sexually. What, what, what's, what's the difference? I'm, I'm a kid attracted Christian. Does it sound harsh? Maybe it's not that it's harsh. Maybe it's that we've actually desensitized ourselves to some of the very real issues in society which are tearing it apart. I'm asked every week by someone, what's happening? I don't know what's happening with our world. I don't know what's happening with our country. I don't know what's happening with our city. I don't know why things are so chaotic. You can go right back to the source. Actually, at, 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 at its very heart, all of this 
is an issue of how we understand depravity and sin mm. and how we understand the holiness of the character of God and the power of the gospel. There's nothing new under the sun. This is what it comes down to. So when you start accommodating and saying and allowing for gay Christianity or that, you know, those, those definitive terms, it's actually an accommodation on sin. We've become so man-centered, we don't even realize it. Uh, and when you become man-centered, you become desensitized to sin, you don't even blush at it anymore, uh, and you start to make smaller and smaller, small accommodations that begin to be large accommodations. And you underestimate the power of the gospel for sanctification as well as for your conversion. Some of the most faithful people I know who lived as homosexuals and became Christians reject any, any terminology of gay Christianity or LGBT. Christianity because they realize identity is in Christ and they've seen their identity transformed because they've been looking to Christ. <clears throat> Covers the whole issue. But you've been washed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we said that um, we would let you go by 2.30. It's 2.35 now. I'm sure there are many other questions. We could probably sit here all day and, um, and talk and build one another up, feel free to have um, discussion and fellowship with one another and stay around. It's been a privilege and pleasure to um, have each of you. And thank you again to Gavin for, for being here and Amanda. Um, thank you very much uh, both for your support and for the investment of your time, resources, and energy in this conference um, for five years. Um, we're very thankful for that. And um, for Ben as well, thank you for for being here and for uh, the good work of Christian Concern, press on. We're going to go to God in prayer just now. Um, Robert, uh, would you please um, pray for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the things that we've heard today. We thank you that our identity is found in Jesus Christ. It's not found in anything else, Lord. We thank you that we've been washed by his blood. We've been sanctified uh, from what we used to be, Lord. We've been saved, we've been forgiven. Um, when we're in him, Lord. And we pray that all of the confusion that's out there in the world, Lord, would not confuse us, but that we'd be clear, Lord, in, in who we are, in what your word says, that we wouldn't deviate from it and wouldn't be conformed to the, the culture around us, but we'd be transformed, Lord, by the renewing of our minds through your word. So, Lord, we pray that each day that we grow uh, closer to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, further away from the sin that we once were once enslaved to, Lord, and that we seek to share this good news that you set us free from these things, and that they too, no matter what their situation is, no matter what their temptations are, that Christ can set them free also. Mm. So I pray this would be our message, and that you'd use us to bring the good news to the people who are confused. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.